This is the uh, picture of the field that's, it's kind of grainy. And you know, the, what kind of camera did I have back in 2005? Not very good. And it's been copied and pasted and copied and pasted numerous times. So um, we basically set this field up. So when we're out there, when you're standing at the watering area, we're looking up kind of up the hill. That's where this pitch, picture was taken. Uh, I've got a hole dug right about here. And then right across the fence on the right hand side of this picture, is this year's bale grazing, right? There's, they're side by side. So there's all the residues. Um, I've got some good drone footage here to kind of show that as well. So that's kind of the comparison. Uh, one year and 17 years ago, the same, the same idea. So it's kind of neat. Okay. So I'm just gonna give you a little, uh, I think it'll just start. A little video first kind of to show a bunch of things. So as the video is going, I'll explain it. There's no sound or anything. So this is the field that, that we just did this last winter. Um, the 17 year old one is off to the side here. That's it. So that's how we would set our bales up. Uh, there's actually three fields. This is another one across the creek. And we did a small one right down on Highway 777. Uh, just the, right there, a small one. Okay, so that's all on the same quarter. And we're also gonna kind of look at a uh, bale unrolling area. So these are the three little fields we did this year. And right here is the 17 year old one, right beside it. And this is where we actually calved, that's where we unrolled bales. So how we set them up, we uh, bring them in with whatever kind of truck we can. I like these ones, they just kind of dump them off. Um, I like them to make a mess. <laughs> I don't want the nice neat stacks, because I want them, he's doing half the work for me, he's spreading them. And then we just come in with the truck, and we grab them and straighten them out and put them in rows. Okay. This is a Chen uh, straightening out my rows for me. Um, I had to speed him up 500 times because that's how slow he was. <laughs> Where does he go? Is he, is he back there? He's hiding? <laughs> oh, just when I was going to get him good, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then we just tip him over. So now they're all lined up in nice straight rows, and now we're turning the cows into them. Why didn't you cut the twine off? Ideally, we do it in the fall. At 10, did you get them all off in the fall? <laughs> No, he didn't get them all off the fall, but we're, ideally, yes. So they're, they're, they're grazing. We did a little experiment this year. We did some where we had four-day grazes, and then we did some where we had 16-day grazes, trying to see the difference in, in usage. So was there a, a reason why you put them on their side and not on their... For the fall, it'll shed moisture a lot better if we get a wet winter. So green feed was the... You can see we unrolled green feed bales in amongst them. Here's some of the residue. We really found the quality of bale makes a big difference on how well they clean up. The really good bales, they cleaned up really good. Uh, the, the bunch with a bunch of thistle and you know coarser grasses in it didn't clean up so good, right? So you're gonna have a lot more residue. So bale grazing is a skill, right? You're not gonna be perfect at it the first year. All right, so this one we got pretty good coverage in between. Bales were a little closer together. I was trying to aim for the number of days, so each pasture was a little bit different size. We wanted 16 bales across, right? Because that was a four day graze period. So if we were a little wider, well, we did 16 bales, the spacing was a little farther. So I, I wasn't so worried about coverage perfect. So now here we are in the spring, the green coming through it. There's your dead spots. Um, by July, August, there will be very, little, very few dead spots left. And this is the 17 year old bale grazing that we're gonna go look at right beside it. Has that ever had bales rolled onto it again? Nope, once, what? 17 years ago. Wow. Yeah, one time. Um, the comparison that I saw, so right beside, there's a fence running up here somewhere. It's hard to see, one wire. Um, I took this field, uh, bought the land in 2001, yeah, seeded it down in 2002. Anybody remember what happened in 2002? <laughs> Most severe drought in 100 years, right? We seeded it down then. Uh, great crop of thistle. Amazing crop of thistle. Uh, hammered that out with cows. I ignored the weeds. I grazed the forage that was out there and just ignored the weeds. Within three years, there was no thistles anymore. Okay, so we managed through that. Uh, but we, in 2005, 2006, that winter is when we bale grazed it. I took that one paddock, split it right in half. One side we bale grazed. The other side we did nothing to, okay? So then that was, that was our demo that, we, that uh, the Gateway Research Organization worked with me. Um, my observations over the, the next 10 or 15 years, the first year, the bale grazing one was phenomenal. 
right? We had grass grown this tall. I'll actually show you. Oh, I'm going to go ahead. Okay, so this was the field we started with. There's the residue. That's what it looked like after that first year, right? Just amazing water holding capacity. I used to think, you know, in my mind, I said, oh, all that fertility we're bringing in with that, with that feed. Actually, I don't think it's so much the fertility. You add fertilizer or fertility to land, it gets used up. But if we can add the water holding capacity and the biology, right, the root systems, then we get this perpetual uh, new fertility coming in all the time, right? You created a system that produces its own fertility because of the biology, okay? So it's a little bit on, on my argument whether why bale grazing seems to do better for me than bale unrolling, because if, we, if they clean up too much, you don't get the water holding capacity, right? Then you don't get the biology, then you don't get the drought resilience. I saw that uh, three or four years ago, I did a little area of bale grazing, um, 2020, and then 2021 hit, which was our most severe drought. In September, where we bale grazed, I still had green grass this tall. So, so are you saying that's from the residue of the bales that they trampled? It was the water holding capacity, not necessarily the fertility we brought in. I mean, when the hay breaks down, that's fertility. Mm -hmm. When the poop breaks down, that's fertility. But in 2021, when we didn't get the moisture, right beside, so we bale grazed here, we unrolled here, because we were starting to calve, so we switched to unrolling. <laughs> September or August, September of 2021, where we unrolled, nothing was growing, it was all brown. Right, where we bale grazed, still standing this tall. Um, I don't know if I got that picture in here, How but. How can you stand looking at all the wasted needles? That's what drives me crazy. It's not wasted. It's not wasted, yeah. I know, but it looks yeah. like it is. Yeah, well, you saw the video there. It's not that bad, yeah. right? It's a skill. The, the first time you do this, you're gonna suck, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you will. You will waste oh, some hay, yeah. but you, but the second time, <laughs> but the second time you're gonna figure out, oh, you know what? Because it was poor quality hay, or because one time I, I bale grazed with fescue straw, right? So they combined the fescue, right? You'd think this is poor quality stuff. Bale grazed fescue straw, they licked up every bit of it, it was gone. Now there's a there's a balance between the quality of the bales, how much they clean up, versus the you know the really high quality stuff. Uh, then the deer also like it out in the middle of the field unprotected, right? So there's a balance there. If you get too good a quality feed out there, then the wildlife go after it too hard. Uh, but if it's really poor quality, they don't clean it up as good. But then the price is less, right? Hopefully. Yes. You said that you uh, unrolled uh, green feed in between your bales you had set up for yep. bale grazing. What was the uh, idea behind that? All we could find was the green feed for extra bales. <laughs> we were looking for them last minute and we got this, uh, a guy sold us uh, 400 bales of green feed. So I thought, okay, we will supplement with the green feed. Hay will be the main diet. And then when we go out to supplement, um, then we can, uh, we'll use the green feed. So we supplemented for two reasons. One, to increase the ration when it was cold, but we also supplemented to decrease the ration when it was warm. Okay, so follow me here. If it's really cold, 40 below, Fahrenheit or Celsius, it's really cold. Um, <laughs> if I wanted to increase the ration when I'm bale grazing, right, I could just move them sooner. Let's say I have a four day graze period. If I wanted to increase the ration, I'll just move them in three days. Or leave them for four days, go out and unroll a couple bales of high quality stuff, right? So I just increased the ration. So instead of, we were aiming at 34 pounds per head per day, that's what my customer wanted. When it was really cold, we went up to 38, right? By unrolling a couple bales, the same time period. Now, if I wanted to decrease the ration because it's only minus 10, right? They don't need that much. It's a nice warm, warm weather out there. I might leave it till, uh, leave for five days, but unroll two bales, right? So they, they'll need, uh, I think they needed four bales a day right, F four days by four is 16, that's why we were putting 16 bales out. So I will leave them to day five, but roll out two more bales. So in, in reality there, I just decreased their ration. So we're using that bale truck that we have and unrolling bales to manage the ration. One, make them, force them to clean up, and two, either give them more or less, right, it's a tool. Um, boy, I didn't know that the first year. Right? Um, you, you we don't have that, but we use the pellet truck. Yep. Little extra pellets on cold days. Yep. Yep. And then 
and that's what I, I use my pellets for. Yeah, I got a big, you know, the flotation tire you saw, I got a big wide one of those, and I put a bar between the, the arms of my bale truck, put it through there, and we can put pellets in there. I cut a hole th right through the middle of it with a chainsaw. Mm. It, I'm yeah. Lazy. I oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Mine was free other than the <laughs> price of a new blade on, or a chain on my chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe the waste is in quality, quality of nutrition. So when I'm unrolling a bale, Right, and some of the bales this year, at 10, if he's still gone, uh, if they don't unroll very good, you go faster, right? Oh, it's not unrolling, so you go faster. I got some drone footage of him going pretty fast trying to get these unrolled. Where's all the high quality leaves, the good stuff going? Right, it's blowing off in the air and, and falling down on the ground. So when you're unrolling a bale, you lose some of the high quality nutrition, right? The alfalfa leaves are falling off. Uh, when I bale graze, they eat it, it's, it's not flying anywhere. They eat a lot more of that high quality stuff. And when you're done a bale grazing field, to me, I mean, especially those, uh, the ones with all the thistle out there, there's, there's a lot of stems left. So there's a lot of volume, but it's the low quality stuff is, is left to a degree. I mean, there's some of the good stuff wasted as well. But when I'm unrolling, I think a lot of those fines, the high quality stuff is blowing off in the wind and dropping through to the ground, which they can't pick up later. Right, so. How does that translate into the water retention? The more volume of low quality in the bale grazing, the stems, gives us more water holding capacity because there's more residue left, right? right? I want some waste. I purposely want some waste because that's building up that water holding capacity. Now, with bale grazing, the big savings is labor and equipment cost, right? Because I only go out there you know, we, we did all that work in the fall when it's nice and warm, pull all that twine off when the, yeah. they're, they're not frozen, right? It's a lot faster then. Uh, so that's the big reason why I bale graze because it lowers my labor and equipment cost. I, I don't own a tractor. I don't own a tractor, haven't in 24 years of, of ranching. Um, so that labor and equipment cost goes way down. That's the main reason. But then that water holding capacity um, is the big benefit afterwards. So yes, sorry, yep. What's the distance between the bales in a row versus, uh, and, and uh, beside each other? If you want them to, the circles to touch, about 25, 30 feet, okay? Now, my advice, just to save you some headache, if you're doing a strip graze fence down it, what I've learned to do now in the last few years uh, is 25 feet between bales in a row, 50 feet between rows. What that does is leave a gap for your electric fence. But then next year, I'll bale graze on the same field and I'll fill in the gap. So it's gonna leave rows, but then you have fewer headaches with you know, cows bumping the fence. Cause picture a, a bale sitting here, six foot in diameter. The next one's 25 feet away. Once the cows start to eat it, that circle gets bigger, right? The residue goes back. So now the, now the bale's this big and now we got a cow butt six feet Where's the fence? Right here. Somebody's going to get pushed into the fence and somebody's going to get knocked into it and it's going to, you know, the post is going to lean over. So I like to do double and then come back next year and do it again. Okay, so that's what we're going to do on these fields. If anywhere where, I mean, next spring or next summer, uh, we'll be able to see where the bales were for sure. Just come along next fall and plunk bales where, where they weren't, right? So then you have In the, win in the winter time, we just work away from the water. And ideally, this winter, it was all snow. Perfect timing all winter long, we didn't have water. Mm. Now, uh, people argue that all the time, oh, you gotta have a water source. If you've got good quality snow, snow they, they did pretty good. We were watching though, as soon as we got to that, you know, a, a, a melting point, right, where it melts and then freezes again solid, yeah, then all of a sudden you got no water, so you have to watch it. We, uh, we will go by, or we're gonna walk right through the mud today, right by the winter water, uh, the wet well that we installed last fall as a backup. We never used it, but it's there. If, I, uh, if, if we lost our snow last winter, we would have set up that system and, and had water for them, so. And like even for lactating cows? Since we're not weaning till they're like nine. What's gonna happen when you take water away from a lactating cow? they're gonna wean their calf naturally, <laughs> right? So is that, do you want that? Um, we had dry cows, 
So dry cows are fine. I've done that with, with bred heifers, it's fine. Usually I have to, I've got a customer, right? Uh, if they want water for their animals, well, I'll set up a system, right? So a winter system of some kind, so. Okay, yes. I have a question about the, so it's temporary electric fence that you're using. Yeah. How does that work in the winter time? I can't, my brain can't figure that out. It's a mind game for the cows. <laughs> for the cows, not for you. Um, I'll send you my article. I got an article that's the five tricks to winter electric fencing. Um, let's see if I can remember them. Um, have well-trained cows in the fall, right? That they know what electric fence is. You got a big fencer there. You make sure they know. If they're getting slack and you're getting slack in the fall because, you know, summer's over, no. You know, make sure it's, you know, 11 kilovolts in that fence. Let, make sure they know. Um, always have a training fence. So I love to have a training fence right by the water. Make sure it's solid posts where they come up if, if we have water, if not by the salt or the mineral tub or something. Where somewhere where they con you know, congregate and maybe bump each other and all of a sudden then I'll, I'll have a positive and a ground wire so that if they get bumped into it, they get it for sure. Um, so uh, maybe I should explain that. Um, in the summertime, normally we just have a hot wire, right? So the power, technically the power comes out of the fencer, through the wire, hits the body, whoops, hitting my mic here, hits the body, um, goes through the body to the ground. Now that pulse goes back through the ground to the ground rod back to the fencer. Okay, power wants to do a circuit. That's what it's trying to quit. So when we get dry, frozen, or snow-covered ground, we lose that connection between the body and the ground. Okay, so that's where the second wire comes in, that ground wire. So here's another system that would be set up with two wires. One would be the hot wire, one would be a ground wire. So now the power comes out of the fencer down the hot wire, touches the body, which is also touching the other wire, goes through the other wire, back to a ground rod, which goes down into the ground below the frost, or below the dry, back to the other ground rod and completes the circuit. Okay, so that's, that's another way to do it. So in the wintertime, you could have a positive and a, and a ground wire, and that eliminates the, the, the snow as an insulator. Now there's another fencer that they came out with called a bipolar fencer. And it, yeah, it has two personalities. <laughs> no. um, it has a full, full potential out of that fencer. So it can be a normal fencer in the summer, but it's got an extra post on it. Now what happens is it sends a half of the power out through the positive wire and half of the power out through the negative wire. Okay? So you could hit either one of them and you'll get half a jolt. Right? You'll, they'll feel it. But if they hit them both together, bam, they get the full one. Okay? So it's an... The problem with the, the first description I told you where you've got the positive and then just a ground, it's, there's no power. If they touch that ground by itself, they get nothing, right? So everybody always has that on the bottom, and I think that's backwards, right? You should have the hot one on the bottom and the ground one on the top, because then when they're reaching under, they'll, they'll feel a little bit, okay? So yeah, you, like I said, when you, when you first start bale grazing, you're going to suck at it, and a big part of that is usually managing the electric fence. And on, if you've got hilly land, yeah, bales can roll too. Make sure you're going uphill. Next time, replan that the, you're moving your fence uphill. Because then if a bale starts to roll, it goes back where you've already grazed. Yeah. Right? Instead of forward into your fence. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good point, good point. That's where we learn, right? It's, it's much cheaper and easier to learn from someone else's mistakes. So. <laughs> Um, so this was the bale grazing field, this was the control right next to it on year one after bale grazing, right? So quite a drastic difference. Reed pulled these two plants out. This was the plant in the bale grazing field, that's a plant in the non-bale grazed field, okay? So quite a difference. Um, I'm really excited about the, the, the results of the soil tests out of these, okay? Um, this is my second, the, the one we're looking at today is my second uh, soil, soil study out of this. This was the first one. The University of Alberta came out a few years ago and they looked at another piece of land that we've been managing for um, uh, 12 to 15 years. 15 years was at the end of the study. Uh, this is our f farm way up here. All these farms got this study. It was the, for carbon sequestration. And uh, I got my results back. So we compared our, uh, our field which we call it, a, they called it an adaptive multi-paddock grazing, that's why it's called AMP, I don't care what you call it. 
uh, and this was a, the neighbor's field across the way. Okay? Same history, same topography, same rainfall, same everything, different management. Okay? Um, 15 years, so, so it was 12 to 15 years prior, these were treated the same. Right? They were basically the same uh, management, continuously grazed. We took it over, started grazing it regeneratively, and we changed the soil profile. Okay? So this was the results from it. Uh, basically, we took, uh, the control was 5.2% soil organic carbon. We took it up to 10.97 in 15 years. Okay? Um, there was basically no topsoil, right? These are the two plugs side by side. Basically no topsoil. It was the same color all the way through. We now averaged an AH horizon, that first layer of topsoil, an average of 10.8 inches in 15 years. Okay? That's pretty good. I'm like, oh man, really? I don't believe that. That's too good, <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay, a lot of people say you can't do that. The thought process, though, is academia who tells us that we, it takes 100 years to grow an inch of topsoil, okay? The reason they think that is because they are relying on residue being left on the surface, right? We know we need to leave residue. That's for water holding capacity, though. That's not for growing soil, okay? Um, what we need is the root exudates. The, the photosynthesis takes carbon out of the air, pushes it down into the roots, and pushes it out through the root systems into, the, into the, your, your base. Okay? So ba this base just got converted. We added carbon to it. I'm not growing soil on top like academia is saying, right? that growing an inch every hundred years. I'm going down into the base and converting it into topsoil. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at today, is how, how, how well we've, we've done that. Okay, so this was a soil test from 2006. Uh, this is the unfertilized one, so this would be the non-bale grazed. We got an organic matter of 2.6%. Uh, so this was after, um, we do have one from 205, but it, whatever, uh, we didn't need to look at that one. 2.6 uh, and 3.2. So those are the two fields that we're looking at. Um, Let's just say it's average of about 3%. Okay, so we didn't have a full study back then. It was just a couple quick samples, right? I don't know, I'm not going to say this is 100%, but we're going to say it's about 3%. Okay, uh, the one that uh, Sandeep Jay and I took uh, three, four, four weeks ago. Um, okay, the U of A one actually did meter, meter uh, deep samples, and I would like to get this one done meter deep as well, because I think they're a little bit more accurate. It shows up here, so A is zero to three, right? Actually more like zero to five, zero to six almost. Almost, okay. But the funny thing is, the top layer was lower than the three to six. Right, I would think that's backwards. And in the soil probe, I'll show you the so soil probes that we did, you can see it. And when we took a full, there was one spot we took a full 12 inches and pulled it out, right at the bottom was dark, dark, dark. And the closer to the top wasn't as dark. I'm like, Hmm, what's going on here? I'm just guessing the last two years of drought, did we actually burn some carbon off, off the top? But it's also showing that our roots are pushing it down even deeper. Sorry, I think I said it wrong the first time. I said zero to three. We did zero to six, six zero to 12. Six, six, Sorry, I said that wrong, yeah. If we're between 4.4 4 and 8.2, so we're about 7% now. So we went from 3% to 7%. It's not bad. Not as good as the other study, but close. But how deep did we go? Right? We started with nothing. This is gray wooded soil de developed under leaf litter in a forest. Right? There's basically almost zero AH horizon. And now we've, we've developed in some places. We see, we're going to go out with some soil probes. You guys are going to tell me how deep the soil is, our AH horizon. We're going to take pasture sticks. Everybody who won a pasture stick today, guess what? We're putting you to work. Because we got multiple soil probes, we're going to probe down in multiple spots and we're going to see where the clay starts and then measure it. Okay, this one is 8 inches, this one is more than 12, right? I think we can only go 12, That's about. As far as we get. Yeah, unless you guys are really good at stomping. Um, but uh, this ground's pretty easy to get into too. It's quite nice. yep. I got the video on here. We, we really raised that carbon in the last, uh, this one would be 17 years from these tests. Okay? But I want to know how deep that went to. We doubled it, but how deep? Okay, interesting thing too is the pH. 
This was forestry soil. Okay, when I first saw these, I'm like, oh, that's pretty acidic, right? Pretty acidic. I wonder what my earthworms can do over 17 years. Okay, so then we went, this is another one. The other one was 5.4, still quite acidic. After 17 years, my earthworms, there it is. There it is. 6.7, 6.3, 6.6, 6.3. Okay, we just solved it. I, I've just spent a bunch of time out in the East Coast, and they're talking about they have to lime everything. You have to lime it because our base material is acidic. You have to lime it. Well, no, you don't. I just fixed it. Okay, so we, there, there, we can do it with biology. It takes time. This didn't happen over two years. It took a long time. Um, but, uh, uh, Jay, anything else? I, we did biologicals too. Now, we don't have the biologicals from, from years ago but we took them this time. One thing that I noticed on the biologicals is our rhizobium bacterial counts were low. And rhizobiums are for our legumes, right? Well, guess what happened in the last two, two years? The drought knocked out all my clovers. Okay. And I'd also like to see what this test would do. We took it early in the season, early June. What does it look like in August? Right? How much carbon do we increase throughout the season as to compared how much burns off over the winter or in the spring. Please keep in mind this is uh, anecdotal information. It's, it's, it's one off. We can't guarantee that it's replicated 100% going to happen on your farm. But very, very interesting just intuitively. And you all can, can come up with the same or different conclusions than we did about how the organic matter was higher in the lower echelons, the lower reaches of the soil, and the pH. Um, if anything is uh, slightly higher, perhaps in the upper uh, areas. So we're working towards better soil, but we're working at it a whole lot more quickly than had been anticipated by just throwing leaf litter on top. Um, and I think, you know, as Steve was mentioning, I think we've got the bale grazing dimensions pretty solid uh, compared to other places. I should have sent you the slide of my polka dot field in San Gudo where uh, they really space them quite far apart, and 90% uh, of the field, there's no difference, no change. But uh, in, the, in the tighter areas, in the tighter fields, like Steve and Murray's, um, boy, there's a big immediate difference right away. So um, we're looking at a lot of mistakes that have been made and a lot of uh, trial and error, but we're sure seeing some good changes in the short term. Yeah. As far as bacteria goes, uh, very interesting that a lot of the lower reaches as well had a more favorable um, microbe population all through the, uh, the profile, whether it was um, the actinomycetes or, uh, or some of the um, bacteria, the favorable bacteria, um, the 6 to 12, if you will, probably underestimating the, the depth a little bit there or overestimating it. Uh, even better uh, profile right across the board than, uh, than in the upper echelon. So we're thinking a lot of lower root development is happening, helping with the aggregates and that sort of a thing. Very interesting. I would love to do this 100 times through 100 fields. That happened just like Steve's. But uh, I keep thinking of that song, if I had a million dollars, we'd be able to do a whole lot more. But yeah. we're doing, doing what we can with what we've got. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. That's actually my question. Absolutely. A baseline soil test would be a great idea. If you can do what we did here in the current one, the 0 to 6 and 6 to 12, um, that would give us a good idea of what's happening throughout the whole soil profile. Um, send it away to any of the recognized labs. We use A&L because it's simple, dumb, and easy, just like me. Um, so we use those. Um, they don't give an actual count, a number of some of them. They estimate it from the, uh, uh, from the products of... Uh, of the bacteria and other things that are in there, but it's super fast and it's super easy to understand. And so I just go and dig out the soil and yeah. it? What we like to do is uh, oh, okay. a benchmark type soil sample where we're in a concentrated area. That we GPS so we know where to go back to. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. get to run the soil probe tonight. <laughs> we'll show you how to do it. It's a tool that you can get these plugs. Um, try about 14 soil probes in a concentrated area for a benchmark sample, um, and then we send that composite sample away to your recognized lab, whichever one it is, and then you've got that baseline. Do your work, do your uh, bale grazing, 
come back in a few years, every few years, test it again, and then you'll see the improvements as time goes on. Does it matter uh, like what time of year you're doing this testing, or as long as you're consistent when the before and after? It sure does. It, the question was asked, and I'm sorry for not repeating the questions if you missed them earlier, but does it matter what time of year you test the, uh, the soils? Try and do it at the same time of year every year because uh, fungi have different time periods of being high and low. Same with bacteria, same with some of the, the worm-like things as well. Um, so try and be con consistent in the timing as well. That's the picture of the soil probe. So it's darker right at the tip here than it is at the top. Right? This is the, closer to the surface. That, that's what was kind of weird to us, but that's what's happened out there. Um, Interesting. And no earthworms were hurt in the making of this video. <laughs> that guy must have been uh, uh, swimming. I don't know if you swim in the soil. He must have been going straight up and down because he went right up that probe and didn't get cut. <laughs> yeah. So this is a penet penetrometer. Yep. Um, uh, Sandeep and Jay and I were out doing this, and I just grabbed this thing just for fun to see what happens. It measures the, how compacted the soil is. So if it measures over 300 pounds per square inch, they consider that too hard of soil for a root to penetrate. So you want soil, you push that thing down until it gets to 300, and that's your compaction, that's how it measures it, right? So a lot of fields you'll go to, you'll get six inches or eight inches, and, and uh, we did this. Okay, that's 22 meter going all the way, three feet inside. Two inches for 200, and then all the way down. Just okay, drops. Let's take the reading to Okay. That's Sandeep's voice, by the way. Okay, let's try. Ready? Okay. Oh. All the way. So it Never made it to 300. Yeah. And this is a clay base. <laughs> okay, so that's the field that we're going to. So, no, no, I just let Sandeep do this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing in the soil probe is when we pulled these out, um, the whole probe was connected together with roots, right? That's that probe we pulled out and it wouldn't fall apart because the roots were connecting it together. So kind of cool that we, some of the things you can see when you, you just go out in the field and look and test and, and you know, observe. That's the, the whole key to this. So. so any other questions? I think that's the end of that. The bale grazing was just a small part of that. Perhaps it provided some additional nutrients. Um, there wasn't a tremendous amount of difference between the area that was grazed and that that wasn't. But what we're looking at is the system that's happened since the bale grazing happened. We've got 17 years of a form of amped or, or multi-paddock grazing sort of a thing. So intensive grazing, short period of time. We think that perhaps the roots really were encouraged to develop after that grazing, just like the top same happened down below. So we're thinking that's kind of cool and that's probably why the depth of rooting happened so quickly and so much. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't finish my, I was halfway through one of those stories. Um, the difference between the two fields, the, the bale grazing one and the control, uh, visually after about 10 years, they were about even. So the, the bale grazing one did really good the first year, like phenomenal that picture I showed you. Year two, it was really good. Year three, it was good. So it started to drop a little bit over time. Whereas the control started out terrible, now I, I do some advanced grazing systems on it, right? I'm starting to treat it good. And it started to get better, okay? Uh, year two or three, all of a sudden we had a wet year and clovers came in, right, to that control. All of a sudden the clovers came in and it went boom. Oh, that looks nice now. Okay, the, other, the bale grazing was still better, but the clovers came in. Now we, after about five years, they were close. 10 years, they were about even. Clovers never came into the bale grazing field. Not for years. How, why? Because you already had the... Uh... We already had the nitrogen, right? We left all that fertility there. It already had nitrogen. Now it's got water. It doesn't need it. The grass has outcompeted any legumes that we're trying to grow. Whereas the other one, we're lacking in nitrogen. All of a sudden you get a wet year. The clovers kick in. They have the advantage because they make their own nitrogen. Boom, the clovers took over, right? So all of a sudden I got fields side by side. One's full of clover. One has nothing in it just because of the situation, right? <laughs> So after about 10 years, they look the same. And ever since, that's 17 years there. So how long did it take me to fix a piece of land with bale grazing? One year. How long did it take me to fix it with uh, good management? Five to 10 years. Okay, so that bale grazing paddock, it's a little deeper, a little better. It had a five-year head start. 
because I cheated, right? I bale grazed, it got a head start. We can do the same thing with just grazing, but bale grazing gives it a kickstart, that's all. So, yes? Uh, what was your experience with, have you ever picked up severely overgrazed, like where horses oh, yeah. on it? Oh, yeah. So what's your strategy like? Bale graze on it if you can. <laughs> I know what you see, yeah. like, like with our soil, it's so hard, right? Like you can't even get a, you wouldn't get that penetrometer two inches in. Yeah. Some pieces of land that I've taken over, I've healed them in two to three years, right? They just catch and they take over, like hay fields. I love taking over old hay fields because yeah. they've had a good graze period, a good rest period the whole time. Where there's something right? to start with. Yeah, you've got something to get going. Um, so years ago, I had a fella uh, in one of the, the boards that I was on. Um, he heard me talk a couple times and he came up to me after private. He said, Steve, I really like what you're talking about, this grazing and your graze period, rest period. Uh, my advice, because I've been doing this for 20 years, it's too slow. You got to kickstart it, right? So his advice back then to me was the first year, hit it with something. Hit it with something that's going to make it grow. Now, bale grazing is my preferred. He said, if you got to hit it with nitrogen, you hit it with nitrogen, but don't take it all, right? The problem now, the nitrogen's through the roof. Now the economics is gone. Uh, back then, though, if you hit it with nitrogen, but then leave a bunch of it, because then you get the water holding. Same as bale grazing. Right? If you could fertilize a pasture and not touch it, maybe go out there in the fall and stomp it into the ground, leave all that residue, what'd you just get? So it's like bale grazing, you leave residue out there, right? One of my fastest way to improve a piece of ground is to skip it. Okay, so if I have a, pa let's say the pasture that we're going to look at here, let, I think there's like 30 paddocks in there. On the good year when I've got the moisture, I'm going to skip two paddocks completely. I'm going to graze 28 of them. Right? I can still do a rotation with 28 paddocks, that's pretty good. My two worst paddocks I'll skip. I'm going to leave all the residue, let them go to seed, let those roots dig down as deep as I can. What did it cost me? The land rent on 30 acres. Right? It didn't cost me anything else, I didn't do anything else. And then the next year, man, those two paddocks are going to be a lot better. So if you can do that on the good years, every good year you get when you know, uh, we get some good moisture, we give back. Right? And then on that drought year, well, now I got 30 paddocks I can graze on the drought year. Okay, so I'm only planning to graze 28 on the good year. So, yes. Um, I heard some of the conflicting arguments, uh, I suppose, between you and Greg. Um, oh, yeah. Where some people like to gra uh, graze their worst field first, and then Greg mentioned he likes to build graze his best field first. Something like that. I've, I don't know if we're going to argue too hard on that one. Wh whichever one's more convenient for me usually is the one I do, but I like to hit the worst ones because then they really get a kickstart, get them going. One of the things that they teach at holistic management class, I went to Kirk Gadzia school in Albuquerque, and when you're limited... I'm getting you to close oh, to the mic. Okay. I thought you were just really lighting me here. Um, we're good now, Steve. Yeah. Um, they teach you if you have a limited amount of winter feed that you're going to be feeding, bales. Do you put that on your 300 bushel per acre land or do you put it on your 40 bushel per acre land? Which one are you going to get the biggest bang from? 300. 300. And that's what they're saying. If you don't have a lot of money, you can't buy a lot of hay, you'll get a faster return and you'll be able to grow more grass on your 300 bushel per acre land. And so that's what we did starting out. I mean, we still feed it on some poor land, but that good land, my goodness. It really gets happy when you feed it like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, and if your land is really good already, you know, to a point, like I don't bale graze on the same field, you know, next year because I don't. It doesn't need it. It's phenomenal. Um, so I'm kind of wasting extra by by doing it there. So hey, six one half dozen the other. You, you get it out there. You get it in the right spot. You run some economics. It 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 does good either way. So um, when you do the full meter profile, what they did was they took out the entire AH horizon as one sample. So that first sample was a variable depth. It was the whole AH horizon. Because if you do the 0 to 6 and 6 to 12, what if the clay started at 8? Okay, so that bottom uh, 6 to 12 was part AH horizon and part clay mixed together. Now you've got a, in my opinion, that's not, a, not accurate. How much was the AH horizon? So in that U of A study, I had some places that were 24 inches deep of AH horizon, other places that were six. And so they would measure that and we got an, a, a more precise, uh, accurate what the carbon was. 
right? So that's, that's the measurement I'd like to do, but this is what we can do with the uh, A&L labs right now. So, but it was good, good, good for today. Yes. Yep. Um, what is your calculation for like the waste percentage? Uh, it changes every year. Changes on the pers the the type of feed a lot. I mean, one year all we could get was moldy hay, right? Like everybody had moldy hay. You couldn't buy good hay. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. That, like when you put that out and you put it out in fall, like in Ontario we get a lot of rain in the yeah, fall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, different environments are different, right? Our advantage here that uh, Mr. Judy doesn't get is we get minus 40 weather. <laughs> is that an advantage? Yeah, no, because our ground is frozen. It's not going to rain on it. Now, the, you saw how I sit, place my bales, so the curve is up. In the fall, if we get heavy rains, that sheds it, right? I wouldn't do this with square bales, okay? Some winters, I've flipped them on end. If I bring the bales in later when it's already frozen and there's already snow on the ground, and the twines are already frozen, it's much easier to pull twines off around the circle and underneath, right? So then they're on their ends. But then if you get a warm spell and that snow sitting on top melts into it, or it's, they're still out there in the spring and that snow melts into the end of that bale, but you get a lot of moldy, moldy feed in there then, right? So you got to be careful on, on that as well. But the percentage of waste was the question originally. Sorry, I was beating around the bush there, obviously. Um, between 10 and 25% normally, um, just depends. Depends on the quality of feed and how, how well you've got your cows trained to electric fence, right? If they're blowing through your fences all, all winter long, you end up with a lot more waste because you didn't force them to clean up, right? If you can use that unrolling every four days or five days to help make them clean up better, right? If you force them on that fifth day to clean up and it's nothing but poor quality feed left, well, that last day their ration really drops, right? But if you really want to make them clean up, unroll a high quality bale. We had second cut alfalfa there this year. Uh, later on, we'd unroll one of those. That last day when they're cleaning up garbage, well, boy, they get some really good nutrition added to it, right? So we're trying to balance that ration off. Yes. Try and consider it as much of an investment as a waste. I know it's hard, but it's a long-term investment in the soil. So it's the, the effect of weather. Because you guys are doing it so early, I, yeah, like yeah. I was expecting you to put it out probably after your first snowfall. Yeah, no, we get it out there. I want, I would like to get all the twines off it before the it's freezing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, there's a gal, uh, Janet McNally. How many of y'all heard of her? She's in Minnesota, big sheep lady, and she does hey, bale. She... Hello, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Okay. Yeah, Janet uh, writes for the magazine called Grays. She's a big contributor there. And uh, Janet does a lot of bale grazing in Minnesota. And one of the things that uh, you do have to watch out for is sheep, because they're a smaller animal, they can go in and start eating on the sides of it, and it can collapse on them. Um, and she sees them getting a bale halfway eaten, she'll go in there and push the bale. So it doesn't, and she still loses one or two, but for the, the amount of uh, labor that it saves her and keeping the animals out on pasture, she's pretty much sold on it. She's, she's a good lady. Yeah, Very passionate sheep lady. Janet nope. McNally. There you go. Excellent. Yes? Uh, so for Greg, with all the experience you've got so far, you got 50 acres, it's fully treed, you want to put animals on in there, what would you do? How would you start it to set it up for success? Okay, so if I had 50 acres, you're talking like cut over, you've got the stumps and stuff in there and lots of brush coming up, yeah. that'd be a fair question. Yeah, like say it was harvested for lumber, Yep. But it's, nobody's touched it in like over 100 years other than So I would go in there, uh, first of all, you got to get those stumps down so you can get equipment in there. The equipment being a pickup truck or a, a tractor and place some bales in there. Do the bale graze. In Missouri, I would unroll bales in there and I'd bring sheep in. Uh, folks, sheep are a lot more aggressive taking round leaves than cattle are. They like a round leaf. And so the leaves that are growing on this bushes, they're going to nail that stuff. All these uh, rose bushes, they're going to clean that up. So sheep just make cattle pasture better. That's what they do. But first of all, you've got to get a perimeter. So you've got to be able to keep the animals on there. And I'd get a water source, and then I'd start putting some carbon. Get a carbon source. Because, folks, when you take timber and you convert it to grass, 
you're taking a fungal dominated area and you're trying to convert it back to more of a, a bacteria fungi 50% ratio. So the only way to do it is with animals. You can't, people tell me all the time, well, I've got some hay, can I just put hay out of my pasture and that'll fix it? No. You've got to get the ruminants out there. You can't just put hay out there and hope for the best. Well, I, I'm too lazy to have sheep, so I usually just store and graze on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, animal impact we talk about, right? for years I talked about animal impact as the hoof action on the soil, right? the physical stimulation to the soil, but there's a whole other part to animal impact, the biological impact. right? Um, getting those animals out there, getting that biology coming out the back end, right? There's, there's biology and food for biology in the manure and urine. There's biology and food for biology in the saliva, in the phlegm. There's even biology that falls off the hair coat, right? So I think having those animals out on every single acre of land that we have is so important for biological impact. That triggers the soil biology. Like that herbivore is a keystone species in a grassland environment. Yes. Yes. Mandatory. There's actually a um, energy field over the top of a herd of animals. And when they move across your landscape, they're transferring that energy into the soil. You can't get enough energy in the soil. But it takes animals to do that. Oh. Then we don't have to cuddle? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just kind of get used to I, I was all right with that. that. I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. So. Perimeter fencing. Is that it? Uh, no, but that's my first go-to, right? For me, I, I've got rented land. Um, it's, it's pretty expensive to put page wire or, or, you know, around a perimeter where I've already got the barbed wire. I've got a lot of challenges with canola farmers, right? There's only so much I can put into this. Um, that's my limitation. I'd love to get sheep out there with them, but I, uh, we're working on it. Uh, Etienne is my manager, and he's, uh, he's got a, a small flock of sheep. They're and okay together though, like sheep and cattle. Yeah. 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 The, the cows will use them as bowling balls for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them go about that high in the air and they flip one. <laughs> but okay. Sheep are pretty tough too. Yeah. Did you yeah. notice a difference between, you say you're doing an experiment with like faster bale graze move versus longer? I think there was a little bit more waste with the 16-day one. I mean, Etienne can uh, jump in here if he has any comments too. Um, but a lot more labor in the four-day one, right? I mean, we would set up 16 days, you're good, right? That's, that's it. So how much labor savings was there versus how much waste there is? Now, we have a customer who paid for that hay, right? So we want to get as much through, through them as possible. So that's why we go out and unroll. We put a little bit of extra labor in there to, to keep the customer, you know, he paid for that hay, he wants his cows, you know, to go through the cows. So, Steve, if you're not using sheep, what does your brush management look like? Uh, higher stock densities. Yeah. Um, we do have some, sorry, if we're not using sheep, what is our brush management? Um, one of the tricks, and, and Greg already mentioned it, is the, the fungal to bacterial ratio. If we have rose bushes, uh, saplings and, and woody species coming into our pasture, that means it's highly fungal, right? It, the, the soil is more fungal. If you have weeds, so thistles and, and you know, the, the, the undesirables coming into your pasture, now you're too far bacterial. Okay, so we want to be a one-to-one -to, -one to have a nice uh, forage stand. So if I got rose bushes and things out there, um, uh, Dr. Nicole Masters uh, explained this to me. If we have a highly fungal pasture, so we've got rose bushes and shrubs coming in, we need to stomp into the ground green growing plant material because that will feed the, the bacteria. So we'll get, we'll get it back to closer to one to one. If we have a bunch of weeds out there, we're highly bacterial, we need to feed the fungus, so what we need to do is stomp in dead plant material. So in that case, you need to let, let it get mature, let it go, right? let it rest, and then come in and stomp it into the ground that's going to increase the fungal. So what direction do you want it to go? I was doing it backwards. I took over a piece of land. I had a whole bunch of shrubs and willows and, and rose bushes coming in. I'm like, I'm just going to rest it, right? I rested it, and then you took cows in there the next spring or that fall and grazed it. I'm encouraging the fungal because I'm tromping in dead plant material. More bush. Yeah, so that was an eye-opener for me. Okay, bacterial versus fungal. What, what, what do you want? Which direction do you want it to move? That's what we, we manage for.
We have questions. You guys have any experience with uh, people feeding silage out on the pastures and what that's doing with the control or the tail grazing? Not a lot. I, I've done it. I actually had a neighbor come down and feed silage to my. I had a pen of 60 bulls. Don't ask me why I had a pen of 60 bulls, my customers. Um, and uh, I basically bought silage off him. Yeah. And the, my neighbor came down and he was delivering four days worth of silage at a time. And he just put it out in the field, just like bale grazing, but he just put silage out in the field for four days. Um, I have no idea what it did to the soil. I have no results on it, but they did fine. Yeah, I don't have any experience with silage. No. no. So. Okay. Um, back to the sheep question. I want to, there's one thing yep. I wanted to cover. Um, when you bring sheep into cattle, and you're going to have a flurd, a, a flock and a herd together, they call it a flurd. The best time to bond those sheep on those cattle is in the winter period, when you're unrolling hay or bale grazing. I would recommend unrolling it just because it lets the sheep and the cattle have more area. If you get them too tight around that bale, that sheep's going to lose out. He's going to get knocked off that bale. But it's the same way when you unroll a long ways. Now the sheep and cattle get used to it. And they're going to knock mm -hmm. the sheep off for a little bit. They didn't get tired of knocking sheep around. They'll start eating. <laughs> and they, they do. They, they, they get used to each other. But in the summertime, you can put them out there. The sheep, he's going to be with the grass. They're going to, be, they're going to have two herds. Folks, uh, Ian's been after me for years to have a flurd. Get rid of it. I said, I can't do that. Well, you can. He said, sell the guard dogs and just turn the sheep in with the cows. I'm like, if I do that, I'm going to lose 50% of my ewes in one, you know, in a week, the coyotes and everything will eat them. And he said, no, he said, just don't worry about it. He said, those will get picked off and the smart ones will learn to stay with the cows. <laughs> and so there's a guy here in Canada that did that. Years ago, he was a big opera. He had 1,200 cows and he fed his sheep through the winter with those cows. And in the spring, he took and got rid of the dogs. And when he turned them out, those darn sheep stayed with those cows. Mm -hmm. All summer. And he was in wolf territory. Oh. Yeah. Forgot where it was at. But he, he was, uh, he ran about 1,500 cows. And he, that's when he bonded those sheep on was in the wintertime. Yep. You've got to kind of get them close where they can't get away from each other. And they'll, they will adapt those sheep or adopt them or whatever. Yes, so there is a question, roughly, because we, we use processors and silage and green feed and whatever. Yep. Expensive. How many cows do you roughly figure, say, on a roll of how many cows do you have on that 16 bales? I had a, I had a, a drone footage of this winter, and I took a screenshot of one, one bale, and you can count 25 head around it. I never knew how many could actually fit around it, but I had the drone, I had proof of it. Um, so 25 could fit, it was pretty crowded. So, but what we're aiming at is so much per head per day. Uh, bunk space is important, right? You can't bale graze on a one day ration. There's not enough bunk space. Two days, there's not enough bunk space. Yep. Three, eh, four is okay, five is, you know, the more bunk space you have, the more, the, you end up, you don't get the skinny cows as, as, as much because everybody, has bunk space, right? If you unroll a day's worth of ration, y your boss cow gets more, right? She's greedy, she's right in there right away, whereas the slow poke that, you know, dawdled over, they end up getting the, the lower quality. She's gonna end up being a skinny at the end of the day. They got four or five or six or seven days worth of ration out there, everybody's eating good for the first, you know, let's say it's a seven day ration. Everybody eats good for the first five days, right? Day six and seven, everybody's cleaning up. And then on day eight, they get a brand new set. Everybody eats good again, right? I unroll a lot of bales. I've owned a bale truck for years. Right? It's a part of my body. If I'm <laughs> without my bale truck, I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do. Um, we unroll, especially when we're getting close to calving, because we're going to be out there more often anyway. And I've had problems with casting, where the cows will sit on a, the hump of a bale left over, and then they'll get leaned over the wrong way, and they're big and fat, and they flip over, and they cast and blow it up and die, right? So my, my rule is I start unrolling when we're getting close to calving. Okay, that's been a, I've lost over, what, last 20 some plus years of, of calving, not every year, but some years calving. I've probably lost four or five animals due to that. So that's too many for me if I can prevent it by just unrolling, so. Uh, ideally, May would be nice. Um, the herd we just did now was a little early because they just came in. So, a couple of warnings about the 
where we're going today. One, the water smells. <laughs> so we might have to work on that. Etienne was out of the room when he was talking about that. He was supposed to be writing all that down. Um, it's muddy. muddy. Was one other thing. One other thing. No, I had another one that, that you, you pointed out today. I'll, it'll come to me. I'll tell you when I get out there. So, yeah, so we're, we're going to go out there now and we're going to take a look at some of this. I got two holes dug. If we need to, I'm going to dig another hole because the hole's, hole's still sitting there. Um, because as soon as it gets wet, it all changes to the same color. When you dig it and it's nice and dry, you can see that drastic change. So, But, uh, yeah, we're going to go do some soil probes. We got the penetrometer. People can try. I don't know what the difference is going to be when it's soaking wet, but compared to three weeks ago. Right. Before we take off, I want to cover one thing yep. real quick. Yep. Um, you're talking about this morning on the bricks, the sugar content on your plants. We had a refractometer and a garlic press at the last pasture walk. And it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun was shining, and we started looking at alfalfa, orchard grass. Um, there was some clover out there, and our, our bricks reading was on alfalfa was around uh, 14, which is pretty darn good. Anything over 7 is really good. Well, the one grass we found was quack grass, and it was over 15, the bricks. Those cows, when you turn them in, that's what they went for. So cows know what is best. The higher the sugar content, the fatter they get, the oh, quicker they get. Grass. There you go. <laughs> I think you need to be planting some quack grass, maybe. We yeah. do have a crack just not here today. How does that uh, affect it when it's raining? You're yeah, going to get so, too much moisture? Well, yeah, so when it's raining, uh, you're going to get a really low reading because there's no sunlight. You always take your refractometer reading around 2 o'clock. If you're going to move your animals three times a day, Make sure one of those moves is at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when your sugar's the highest. That's when the animals will get fatter. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're mowing hay, when's the best time to mow hay? When the sun's when out. When the bricks is the highest. Yeah. You're going to capture that sugar in that plant. 